speaker until last. But tonight we're going to do a uh, little different. We have the best one first. And then uh, we'll have, who's second anyway, is it? Well, whoever it is. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce uh, Dub McLeish. Dub the utter failure. He failed as an editor. <clears throat> His problem was that he stood firm for truth and he was not correct. He failed as a nail <laughs> because again he stood for truth and opposed error. In fact, I would say that those failures are here because he has stood for the truth. He has stood the test of time. He's a grumpy old man. <laughs> But I'd like to be around grumpy old men like him because I know that they love the truth and they are to stand for it, defend it against all who may oppose it. So we feel it's a privilege to have him here tonight to speak on this very timely subject, fellowship and suffering. I know that he'll do an excellent job and have pity on you. <laughs> There's a saying some of us have had, God, you haven't been loved, loved to been loved by a liberal. <laughs> I paraphrase that a little bit. You haven't been introduced till you've been introduced by Kenneth Cone. <laughs> <clears throat> It's my great joy to uh, stand before you tonight. I owe a uh, debt to many of you who are here. It's not a financial debt, so don't get excited. <laughs> <clears throat> I can pay my moral debts much better than I can my financial debts. Uh, I'm so thankful for Buddy and Burnell for opening their home to me again. Always enjoy being with them, get to see one another very little during the lectureship. And uh, I'm so thankful for Buddy and Ken and uh, Jack as the elders here and what they mean to me, what they have meant to me for a number of years, what they mean to the cult of Christ, and especially what they mean to me because they accepted uh, oversight of my work about a year and a half ago, and it's been my joy to uh, join hands with them in that very special and close way since that time. I count Brother Dave Brown, a dear personal friend and a uh, uh, holder in the kingdom, and I know uh, you do too. I'm an impromptu speaker tonight as far as having a manuscript of what I'm going to say in the book. I have a manuscript in the book, but don't try to read the book. You'll be terribly confused. It's on a totally different subject from the one that uh, assigned me on this occasion. But uh, I'm glad to address, uh, in the best way I know how, the subject of fellowship suffering. God's faithful people enjoy fellowship in many different contexts. We're enjoying a wonderful fellowship here tonight in this ascended worship we regularly do. At noon today, we had a wonderful ship as we ate it. There's another context of it. We can enjoy a very wonderful fellowship just by visiting with one another. The camaraderie that there is between those who love truth and would die rather than surrender it. And all of those are based in the spiritual blessings which we have in Christ Jesus, which is a fellowship we enjoy because we are in Christ Jesus. But there is another element or text of fellowship we sometimes don't address very much, 
or think of in terms of fellowship, and that's suffering, the subject tonight. I hope to uh, get us to thinking tonight about how real a fellowship there is among God's faithful people and has been since almost the dawn of time in spring for the sake of righteousness and service to God. Now, by suffering, I don't mean what happens to us. We have a terrible car wreck, and we end up with two or three broken bones in the hospital. That's not the kind of suffering we're talking about. That's suffering, but that's not the suffering we're talking about tonight. We're not talking about uh, suffering, emotion that one might go through when he loses or she loses a dear, dear one in the flesh. But we're talking about suffering that is brought upon us because we're faithful to God. Persecution is what it is commonly called. That's the suffering all of God's people through all time have had fellowship in. The devil will see that that happens. Now this is a timely subject because the climate in our nation right now due to godless and evil forces is doing its best to bring suffering persecution and stress upon every element that they might be connected with Christianity in its broadest sense. And it's also because those who must be exposed for their compromises on the subject of fellowship of 20 months or so have brought suffering upon those who are determined to not let them get by without exposure and opposition. And so it is indeed timely that we talk about this subject tonight. Five points, I'll cover as many of them as I can. Here are the five points. I want to set before us first the normalcy of suffering for righteousness sake. And then I want to talk about the warnings God's word gives us concerning suffering. Then I want to look at the sources of suffering. Then we should look at the preparation for sufferings and finally the responses we should make to sufferings. Now let's see how far we can get working down that thing. When we suffer for righteousness sake, we are in fellowship with those who go all the way back to Abel out of the Garden of Eden. And all of our spiritual forebears from him down to this time and all who shall come after us, we are in fellowship. We partake with with them in suffering for righteousness sake. You cannot be faithful to God without suffering some. And so, in Testament, we read of Job, and then of Moses, and of David fleeing Saul in the wilderness, and of Jeremiah and all of the atrocities practiced against him. There was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There was Daniel. Paul down to every one of the prophets that God sent to his people, rising up in the morning and sending them, as the statement so often says in the prophets. They all suffered for the sake of righteousness. The Lord reviewed this somewhat and must have made the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees most uncomfortable as he did, as in his final point in the great sermon of woes in Matthew chapter 23, 29 beginning, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the sepulchres of the prophets and garnish the tombs of the righteous and say, If we had been in the of our fault, we should not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye witness to yours that ye are the sons of them that slew the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye all of vipers, how shall ye escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and white men and scribes, some of them shall ye kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that upon you may come a righteous blood shed from Abel, the righteous Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom ye sue between the sanctuary and the altar. The Old Testament worthies suffer for righteousness' sake. It's no different when we come to Testament. 
There's John the baptizer, paid with his life. The apostles, soon after Pentecost, arrested in Jerusalem twice. Stephen stoned. The entire church in Jerusalem with the onslaught of Saul of Tarsus. Paul then became the apostle and persecutor Saul, and we have a list of at least some of his sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. John, who gave us three epistles, the gospel account, and the book of Revelation, was banished to the Isle of Patmos when he wrote the Revelation. The Revelation itself is against a backdrop of organized imperial persecution from Rome that had already begun with the close of the first century and lasted much, much longer. Do you remember the question Stephen asked the evil audience? gnashed on him with their teeth, dragged him out of the city, and stoned the life out of his body. Acts 7, verse 52. Which of the did not your fathers persecute him? There's not a one they could name. But so the New Testament worthies likewise were put to the flame. John wrote John 3, verse 13. Marvel not, brethren. If the world hated you, we should not be surprised, brethren, when we're called upon to suffer. So we have uh, the honor of suffering with others who've gone before. It's normal for God's people to suffer. The Bible gives us warnings concerning sufferings. David was likely still fleeing from the wicked Saul in the wilderness of Judea when he wrote the 37th Psalm in 32, the wicked, the righteous, and seeketh the slay. But doesn't that the ground in every generation of God's people? In the immortal 53rd chapter of Isaiah's prophecy, in verses 3 through 8, he foretold that Wicked men would despise and reject and wound and bruise and oppress and afflict and cut off our Savior. Warnings of persecution, suffering. When Jehovah gave Jeremiah his commission in the first chapter of Jeremiah's longer book, he simply said, They'll fight against thee. I'm sending, them, uh, to, sending you to them, but this is what you will meet. They will fight you. And he's more explicit even to Ezekiel, to the Jews in captivity. In Ezekiel <clears throat> chapter 2, he says, first of all, in describing them in verse 3, that they are rebellious, they're impudent, and they're stiff-hearted. But he goes away in verse 6, Be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. And he was going to face when he went to those hard-hearted Jews. We have warnings in the New Testament. The last of the two, uh, last two of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 have to do with persecution. Verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, he's stretching all the way back to righteous Abel. He brings it down to those sitting at his feet. In verse 11, he says, Blessed are ye when men shall reproach you and persecute you and shall say all evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And he said, Great is your reward in heaven. So our Lord warned those of his day that as the righteous people of the past, all of the prophets, had been persecuted. They could expect to be persecuted. It would be a blessing to be so. In John 15 and verse 20, Jesus tried to help the apostles prepare for his departure from them and what they would face as they began to carry out the greatest of all commissions. He said, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The next chapter, John 16, verse 2, he come, The hour cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they are doing God a service. 
Isn't that like some people we know in the world today? To the church in Smart Lord Road, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Fear not the things which thou art about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may die. And you shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death. Not just going to jail. But I will, and I will give thee the crown of life. Not a, just a good funeral passage for some elderly, from some grumpy old man that has been for all his life. Now, we're to be faithful to the day that we die. This is a, it's directed at people who are going to undergo persecution. You die rather than renounce me, and I'll give you the crown of life. Thus, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, the promise comes. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer, suffer persecution. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial among you. Why should people think it strange that we are called upon to suffer, that the world despises who we are, what we are, what we stand for, and that some, not just in the world, do so as well. We indeed should expect suffering. We should be surprised if we don't have to suffer some for the cause of Christ. What are the sources of our suffering? We've hinted at them already. They come from without. I think of uh, Israel in Egypt. How many generations were under the rule of the taskmasters of Pharaoh and his regime. And then as God began to leading them through the wilderness to Canaan, they were attacked while they were going through the wilderness. And then after they got over into Canaan, after they viewed the land for the most part, they began to relax, they began, well, they began to get soft and lazy and started intermarrying with the idolatrous tribes. And here came the pagan nations against them. And finally, so much God allowed this to happen, they were taken into captivity. But they suffered greatly and from outside sources. At the end of the century, Rome had made it illegal for anyone not to worship the emperor. That affected every one who had named Christ. Between Pentecost and the end of the first century, there, of course, was the opposition of the Jews who had not believed the gospel of Christ. Persecution first broke out in Jerusalem, as we've noticed already. And then in other places where Paul would go, when he'd go into the synagogue first, uh, there would be a few in some places who to him and obey the gospel, but generally he'd be out of the synagogue, and then those same unbelieving Jews would chase him from city to city to stir up trouble against him. And so from outside sources came persecution upon God's people in all previous ages. 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4. Peter indicates to us that godly people will think our way of behavior is strange. Because of that, they will often persecute those who rebuke their wickedness, even if we don't word just by the way that we live. They cannot stand the rebuke. The ACLU in our nation today is the focal point of every godless, humanistic, atheistic, secular influence in our culture. And it is doing everything within its power with much help help many people in high places to destroy even any symbol of Christianity in its broadest sense as they see it. And sooner or later, if that is not assuaged somehow by getting sensible judges in our courts who will enforce the law instead of making law, 
there's going to be a homosexual walk into one of our buildings and demand membership or demand acceptance, maybe demand be an elder or whatever, or perhaps some woman will walk in and demand to be placed in the pulpit. A suit will be filed. It will be taken before a federal judge somewhere, and you know who's going to win that suit, that case. And brethren may have to go to jail. Buildings may be padlocked. I don't think I'm an alarmist to say that, brethren. I think some of the younger generations who are in here today may undergo something like that. That's persecution, suffering from without, just because we're trying to be God's people. The suffering and persecution come from within as well. We've already chronicled how that Israel executed all of the prophets that God sent to her. There is not an exception that I know of in all of the Old Testament record to that. When our Lord came, it was his own people who rejected him. He came unto his own and received him not. I don't think that's just his family, although his immediate brothers at first rejected him. But I think he's talking about a broader number of people who were his own, his own nation. Among those Jews who believed after Pentecost, many opposed the truth and who were preaching the truth because they were determined to superimpose the law of Moses upon the gospel of Christ and make the church just an offshoot of Judaism. And thus they would follow Paul and they would stir up strife by false doctrine in the churches where Paul had gone from city to city. And so many of his epistles, as you know, reflect that very thing and must oppose and do oppose those Judaistic teachers. They did their best to destroy Paul's reputation in places like Corinth and Galatia, churches. And Paul's catalog of sufferings for us in 2 Corinthians 11, he includes this poignant one, in perils among false brethren. Now, brethren, such matters have not changed in our time. It sure remains constant and static. We should expect persecution from wicked, pagan, blasphemers. But surely our own will persecute us. Well, few have shown themselves more unloving than the liberals we mentioned earlier who so often preach on love. But not all the persecution from within. From those whom we would cover and change agents but from others who cannot abide reproof or correction for their misdeeds, for their errors, for their sins. Any of us who have several years tried to staunchly contend for the faith to be set for the defense of the gospel have suffered some at the hands of brethren. We just need to accept that fact, and we know that that is so. And these brethren who brought that suffering about may generally be conservative doctrinally. In congregations, such things as congregational politics and protection of congregational financial resources and sources, guarding of family members from public rebuke, guarding friends of those who are powerful in the congregation, and other things often turn otherwise doctrinally sound men into rabid persecutors of the righteous. And when such men turn on you, they forget the simplest principles of gospel ethics. The golden root is a little stranger to them. They will treat you worse than an infidel. They forget honor, ethics, and even signed contracts if it's convenient. A persecution may come from an elder who has a pet doctrine that he's determined to fasten upon the church and others of his elders may defend him rather than face him down. 
protect brotherhood like congregational uh, persecute suffering. It goes brotherhood wide as well. Politics enters in, networks of brethren, protecting again of financial sources and resources for a pet school or a pet project, favor toward family members or special friends. These have turned many men of otherwise sound repute into compromisers, into defenders of error and I dare say even into outright liars and slanderers in some cases, as events of the last 20 months have clearly demonstrated. You know, those who are beneath quote unquote yellow journalism as the contending for the faith rag, don't bat an eye at composing a vicious tech letter and sending it to hundreds, not thousands of people at the cost of thousands of dollars. Well, these compromising brethren have done and continue to do their best to intimidate and are to defame those of us who are determined to not let them pass in their compromises, in their endorsement and defense of those who are not worthy of endorsement and defense until they repent. And these attempts at intimidation of trying to close some of us out, of seeing that financial resources and employment are taken from some their simple form of suffering that God's faith and fellowship in. Paul could have well had such brethren in view when he warned, beware of the dogs, he's not talking about four-legged sort. Beware of the evil workers, beware of concision, and this was in the sweetest epistle that Paul wrote, the one to the Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 2. We serve notice that at least some of us will not be intimidated. We will not shut. If we don't bring a one of these brethren repentance, then those who read the history of our time a hundred years from now will know that some stood for the truth and what the issues were in our day. Amen. They're determined to bring a friend rather than repent. How do we prepare for suffering? Well, I think there are several keys in the Scripture. First, just the knowledge that we are not the only ones who have ever had some persecution brought against us. And, and I don't want this to turn into uh, something uh, like we're making martyrs of ourselves or something. That's, that's not it at all. <laughs> But uh, as we look at the record of those who've been made to suffer for righteousness' sake, just the fact that others have suffered and others more righteous than we probably have suffered and much more than we, surely that should give us some preparation to endure whatever little suffering that's brought upon us. Hebrews 12, verse 3, we should remember our lost suffering. The writer says, For consider him that hath endured such gainsaying of others against himself, and that ye wax not weary, fainting in your souls. Properly directed fear will help us prepare for suffering. As our Lord the apostles, after naming them, then telling them what they were to preach in the limited view, Matthew chapter 10, he warned them of sufferings that would be theirs. He said, you're going to be arrested. You're going to be brought before councils and synagogues, kings and governors. Others are going to betray sons, and sons are going to betray fathers. And then he said in verse 28 of Matthew 10, Fear not him, but destroy the body. But I tell you whom you shall fear, him who can build soul and body in hell. 
properly directed fear. Fear of God more than any man or men of earth will help us prepare for any suffering that the devil may send our way. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 2 17 is preparation material for suffering as well as for standing. Paul says, Don't to stand when the evil day comes. Here is the preparation you need. The evil day will include persecution and suffering. Put on, he says, the whole armor of God. He names all the pieces of the armament, and then he says, take the sword of the Spirit. Notice he doesn't say the Holy Spirit will put on for you the whole armor of God. He said, you put it. Every one of us has the responsibility. The Spirit's not going to do it for us in spite of what some teach. We should follow his example. That will help us be prepared for suffering. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. For here and two were you called. Because Christ so suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I've heard many, many times this passage ripped from its context and said, See, Christ is our example. We ought to live. live. That's not the context here. The example here is his suffering. Yes, we need to follow that example. We need to follow all the rest of the example, too. He that saith he abideth in him, John says, 1 John 3, 2, or 2, 6, ought himself also to walk out. Now, there's the general example of Christ. The one here in 1 Peter 2, 1 is the example of suffering. That's an example of all of two. 1 Peter 3 and verse 16. Peter says, having a good conscience that wherein you're spoken against, they may be put to shame who reviled your good manner of life in Christ. A good conscience, an upright life will prepare us for suffering. It will not give the devil and his henchmen a hold if we're living as we'd be living, brethren. The Lord has equipped us through his word to prepare for suffering. Now, how should we respond when suffering and persecution come? In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, Paul says, For our light afflictions for a moment worketh for us more and more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. What's he telling us here? He's saying, Can eternal perspective, don't just think about this life, don't just think about tomorrow or next year or ten years. Keep your eye on heaven, the eternal weight of glory. And if Paul and all of the sufferings that he underwent could say it was a light affliction compared to eternal glory, anything I might have to suffer will be super light because of what he said. Keep eternal perspective. We should count suffering a privilege. Begins 1 verse 29. Paul says, because to you it hath been granted in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to serve on his behalf. Paul says, think how privileged you are. This means that you are doing what the Lord wants you to do because the devil is picking on you. He would leave you alone if you're doing right. And so privilege to suffer for Christ. First Peter 2 and verse 20. Peter says, if when ye do well, ye suffer for it, ye shall take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Patient under suffering. This means we are to be long-suffering under it. It's hard to do. It's hard to do when brethren or people of the world bring suffering against us. It's hard to be patient. And bear with that, isn't it? But we should. We may leave vengeance to God. 12 and verse 17 and then 19. Render to no man evil for evil, Paul says. Then he says, Avenge not yourselves, beloved, but rather give place unto the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, brother, I want to make this note right here concerning vengeance. Defending one's good name and reputation is not taking vengeance. 
If that were so, Paul contradicted himself because he defended himself. He knew that if he allowed his enemies to destroy his name as a faithful apostle of Christ, his influence in the kingdom would be gone. Every one of us has the right when we are under attack and defamed and slandered to defend ours and to show that these things are not so. That is not taking vengeance. We are to rejoice at the back eternal glory. James chapter 1 verse 2, he says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into manifold temptations or trials. Verse 13 echoes, But in so much as you are because of my suffering, rejoice. The revelation of his glory also ye may rejoice with exceeding joy. I don't believe I am alarmist when I say that godless humanistic forces may succeed in bringing physical persecution on some of our younger generation. And I don't believe I'm exaggerating when I say that brethren of various strata of doctrinal positions from the ultra-liberal to those once considered sound in the faith are quite adept at causing suffering for those who are determined to stand for the truth at the cost of fortune, employment, or even blood. Let us never ask, brethren, when we suffer for righteousness' sake. That's the key now. It's for righteousness' sake. Why me? Ought we not to ask, why not me? If we're faithful to God. One thing is certain. If one is willing to live for Christ, he certainly will not be willing to die for him. God bless us all. Let me throw out You may not recognize it, and or perhaps maybe you have recognized it, that uh, Doug's presentation tonight was really an autobiography. <laughs> and many of those things that he has enumerated tonight was from personal experience. And it is, it is a privilege to uh, suffer for the cause of Christ to the most privileged people I know. And uh, no wonder he's a grumpy old man after to deal with all, all that he's had to deal with. But uh, uh, and, and he was right; it was an impromptu. He was not to sign this, so he, he's done a an excellent job in in specifying exactly those things for which we are to suffer. And I'd say, in addition to, uh, it is not uh, vengeance to defend one's name. It's also not vengeance to point out the hypocrisy of those who oppose truth and, and uh, as long as we're able to do, we need to continue to do that. Uh, it is not uh, wise to uh, say disparaging remarks about someone who is to follow you uh, in the pulpit and Lynn is to follow me in the pulpit. So I want to say something kind to I'm trying to but uh, <clears throat> but uh, Lynn is no less a gospel preacher than than uh, Dub. The only thing is uh, Lynn is not 